Welcome to the Birds and the Bees podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. That's the key. People aren't talking about it. Everybody needs to know that porn is not a documentary. It's not like if we don't talk to kids about sex and sexuality, they're not going to hear about it. They're just not going to hear about it from us. They have tons of questions. They just don't know how to ask them. All you have to do is be one chapter ahead. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Just one chapter ahead of wherever your child is. Welcome to Birds and Bees Podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. I'm a certified sex therapist in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I am here to help you understand more about sexual health. Talk to your kids about it. Talk to your partner about it and build us all up together as a hive because we're all hive mates. I'm excited to have you here. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the hive. If this is the, if you're coming back, I really appreciate you coming back. Glad to have you as a hive mate. Today we are going into episode two with Janelle Marie Pierce who is the founder of the STD Project. And we are going to be talking about stigmas and STDs, STIs, and everything that you need to know as an adult, as a partner, as a person that is a sexual being about um, sexually transmitted diseases and infections. So we covered today what what you do if you feel like you have an STD, even if you don't feel like you do, what the process of getting tested for STIs and STDs are, the different types of um, STDs that uh, can go unnoticed, as well as you can do to protect yourself and if you have been diagnosed, what this means for you. So be prepared for a wonderful episode with Janelle. This is really amazing to have this information, especially to be with someone who has dedicated her her professional career in understanding STIs and STDs. Understand that life doesn't end after an STI or an STD. There is there's help, there's support. We're so excited to to have you here with us on this episode. Without further ado, I'm going to jump straight to the interview with Janelle. Again, if you have any questions, comments, 385-449-1818 is the number you can call. You can send me an email, birdsofbeespodcast.com, and we really appreciate your reviews. It helps us get out to even more people who need this information and brings more people to the hive. Love you guys. Thank you so much for all your support throughout the, these past couple years. I really appreciate you. And I look forward to having many more episodes with you. And I'm excited to have you with me. Welcome to Birds and Bees Podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. And I'm here in Salt Lake City, Utah. But I'm on the phone with Janelle Marie Pierce, who is over the STIproject.com. Janelle, welcome back to the show. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. And as I said, I'm in Salt Lake. Where where are you located, if you're comfortable sharing that? Yes, I'm in Asheville, North Carolina now. I'm originally from Michigan, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And so now I'm in some a super eclectic, hippie, outdoorsy, liberal area. But I come from and I grew up in a very conservative um, area of the country. And so I didn't realize you were in Utah. Like, oh, that's interesting. That's, yeah. I was just seeing some like there were memes online the other day about a beer that had come out and it was like a polygamist brew. And you definitely don't want just one or you know, one is not enough or something. It was really funny. And it was all breweries and there's like a distillery over there too. And anyways, uh-huh. it's, I think it's, it's called because that was like just morning as I was scrolling through. Yep. The polygamy porter. I believe that one is a uh, Wasatch brewery yes! or something. <laughs> yes, you know it. That's so funny. Oh my gosh. I just, I just saw that on my social media today, this morning, this morning. So, that's funny. And that's cute because I'm, I'm a beer drinker in Asheville's beer city, USA. So yeah, go figure. Small world. Anyways. Very small world. Well, cool. I, so you're over there. I'm here, but we are talking about something that affects everyone from coast to coast as well as worldwide. So those of you listening in Australia as well as, man, we have a lot of listeners from across the world. So it is exciting to have you here. And we were talking about something that affects everybody, STIs and STDs. So I'm excited to explore more. Uh, we did one episode on this that was geared mostly towards parents, but also has a lot of information about um, some different statistics how to have these conversations possibly with partners, but we're going to get more in depth today about talking to your partner, knowing more about STIs uh, for yourself, as well as getting tested and a couple other things that, uh, that we find important to know about STIs and STDs. So starting this all off, 
we first off want to start with decreasing the stigma of STIs. And this is a big thing for you, Janelle. I want to know what is what is pushing you to help decrease the stigma of STIs? Why why are we doing that? Yeah, the, my my real motivation behind it is to provide and generate and cultivate resources that I needed when I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed when I was 16 years old with genital herpes. And for years, like I spiraled, I was, I struggled with mental health and depression and anxiety all around my diagnosis, as well as then for a little while I experienced or experimented with drugs and alcohol. And mm-hmm. I just felt lost and completely alone and wanted to hide. And that was part of the whole like drugs and alcohol. If I could just, I don't know, smoke it away or drink it away or mm-hmm. whatever and, and not have to deal with reality. And, and my reality at the time was feeling very judged, misunderstood. And for a little while too, I embodied that stigma. Like I embraced it and thought, this is what other people think about me. They think I'm oh. trashy, I'm dirty, I'm promiscuous, I'm tainted, I'm damaged goods, I'm being punished by God. I, I grew up in a Christian reformed household and, um, or, well, I was going to a Christian reformed church at the time anyways, when I was diagnosed, but mm-hmm. anyways, a lot of religion and stuff in my background and we were regular church attendees and I was in the youth group and things like that. And so I really did feel like I'm being punished. Like this is a, this is a result of my actions and I'm a bad, bad girl. And it was, and the thing is, is later, Like it took, it took me way longer than I wish it did. But like at 29 years old, I'd finally had tons of professional success. I had, I had multiple honors degrees, collegiate wise, and I had a very healthy relationship. I had really great friends and family and a support network around me. And Mm -hmm. my identity was not carved out by the stigma. Like I didn't actually believe that about myself. And I thought, wait a minute, this doesn't add up. Like supposedly I'm all of these very bad things but that's not truly how I feel about myself. That's not how I view myself when I look in the mirror, when I get up every day, and when I go to bed at night. And so I yeah. thought, why is that? And how can I reconcile these two totally juxtaposing ideas? And why is it that they persist? Why is this that this this information continues? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, that was the whole idea. And that's that's my intention now is to try and normalize the conversation to some extent, right? We're still talking about sexual health and bodies and intimacy and such. And so I get that there's there's a level of that people want to keep some things amongst themselves, their partners and, and private to an extent. And that's totally cool. I respect that. But at the end of the day, this is like you said, this is something that really impacts everyone. Even if you've never had an STI, which if you've been sexually active, there's almost no way to know for oh. sure. And even if you've been tested, and that's the crazy thing, right? Like I hear that all the time for people like, well, I haven't had any STIs, but I think what you're doing is really cool. And I'm like, that's fine that everybody (laughs) wants to like give me that caveat and set it up that way. But ultimately I'm like, well, you know what? (laughs) 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 There's really no way to know for sure. So Mm -hmm. that's cool. But hey, let's chat about it on that level. And let me, and let me like (laughs) give you some information here and like totally blow your mind. And then people walk away like, oh, I don't know if I liked that conversation. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I don't know if I wanted to know that much, but, you know, knowledge is power. And I think that's the baseline from all of it is communication and knowledge. You have to communicate knowledge, right? So, Uh but without that knowledge, we just, we go forward making the same decisions and feeling like not excited about the decisions we're making with our bodies. And then we end up either regretting something or having something that's not ideal happen and not knowing where to go with it. And so it's just help, helping to make that a little bit less scary for everyone. Totally. Essentially. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Especially if you feel like you're, what I've noticed as a therapist is if you feel like you're the only person that experiences something or that is the only person going through something, that there tends to be an increase in shame, which means there's an increase in isolation, loneliness, and it can tend to increase anxiety, depression, as well as just this overall feeling of I'm worthless. And This, I think, is something that if we don't talk about sexually transmitted infections, then we're not going to be covering what uh, what your experience was. And you talk a little bit more about this in the last episode, Um, but feeling as though you were the dirtiest and you were the only one that experienced it because of what your doctor had said. And um, all these things come down to if we can really understand, hey, this is something that if you um, experience it or you're worried about it, let's go get some support. And if you can get some support, we can negate some things. We can get you, you know, the most support that you need and really get you to 
pleasurable experiences and um, your best healthy self and whatever that may look like and whatever that may may feel like. I guess that leads me into one of my the questions that I'm curious about is if someone is saying, you know what, I don't know. One of the stats that you said it last time was 80% of people um, have been diagnosed or, or have HPV or get HPV in their life. And that is a huge number. So if someone's listening going, well, what if I, I don't know. How did how does someone go about getting tested or how does someone go about um, going through the process of um, getting tested for an STI or an STD? There's a handful of different ways you can get tested. So you could go to your local public health department mm-hmm. and ask for a panel. And most public health departments offer free STI testing and then um, STI, STD testing. And it's usually only a couple of infections, though, that they're offering because they're offering it at a free price point, of course. Okay. And so they're testing the infections that are quite, not the most, not always the most common, but they are, um, the tests are common and the infections are also common. So mm-hmm. not necessarily the number one infections, but they're also, they are common infections and the tests are commonly available, readily available at a very low price point. They're accessible. Mm-hmm. And so those infections from like your health department that you usually can get tested for, and you have to ask because every health department's different. What they offer is going to be different. Um, whether by county, by state, by, uh, by country and such. But anyways, that they often offer HIV, syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. Mm-hmm. Some will also offer a test for hepatitis C, and some will also offer a test for trichomoniasis or trick for short. So that's potentially anywhere from four to six infections at most. You could also go to your general practitioner and ask to be tested for STIs. And some STI tests are covered as part of the Affordable Health Care Act if you're in the United States. And different countries then also do different STI tests, like some of them are covered with health care and health no insurance, depending on what your health care package is and whether it's public health care or not. Yes. So wow. some of this is free for anybody anyways, just depending on exactly where you're located. So you have to ask and find out, you know, is this going to cost me and which tests are you going to do? And then um, Planned Parenthoods are good. Uh, those are international and they will do usually that same similar panel that the public health departments would do, but then they also offer some additional tests that are are usually on a sliding scale based on your income. So you mm. can often ask Planned Parenthoods to test you for herpes, HSV one and two, which is a blood test. So if you don't have any signs or symptoms, you don't have an active outbreak, but you think you may be at risk, you think you may have engaged with in activities with somebody, or you know someone who already has it and you engage in activities with them and you're like wondering, did I contract it from them? You can do a blood test and find out, and that's just for herpes. So, yeah, so there's a ton of different tests. You usually can be tested for about four to six. You can go to a myriad of different places. You can also buy them online, Mm -hmm. and online it is not inexpensive whatsoever. It's, It's certainly not cheap. So it depends on what your resource level is, uh, but you can usually online get tested for the highest number of infections. So anywhere from like 10 to 14 infections, you can be tested for through an online private provider Mm -hmm. just by Googling STD tests online. And so then you can either get them delivered to your home or you can go to a lab and have lab tests done at that lab location. So there's quite a few different options, which doesn't, Mm -hmm. it's tough because then it's like, well, which is the best? Which one should I do? Some of it's going to depend on how much money do you have to spend on this? Mm -hmm. How often do you want to get it done? So if you're getting it done often, maybe you have multiple partners or you've got new partners pretty regularly. And so you want to get tested before and after each new partner. And so then you you want a a a little bit of a lower price point than maybe you're going to like the public health department Mm -hmm. or a Planned Parenthood option. If Maybe this is just before you fully engage with a new monogamous partner that you plan to be exclusive with for a long time. So you're not getting tested very often and or don't anticipate a need to be getting tested very often. You might want to do a larger package with a private provider. So it's all going to be based on what you feel like is the best option for you. But the short story is is that you can't be tested for all the things. There's 30 plus infections and you can only be tested for a max of about 14. So and most people are usually regularly tested for about four to five infections, which is all great. um, But it's good to know actually which infections you're being tested for as well as getting tested in general. Mm -hmm. 
Great. And you even, you, uh, I think you have a blog on this and you went through the testing process in America as well as over in the UK. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. We work with a couple of different providers overseas and, um, as well as in the U S and so I've done, I've done the online packages. I've done, um, the, I've done both the Planned Parenthood. I've done the public health departments. I've done all of the tests at Mm -hmm. all of them or all of the, what's, what's provided or what was locally available. And so I've experienced what the differences are like, what the experience is. They're not very different. Um, some of it depends on whether you want to go in person or whether you want to do it in the privacy of your own home. And some of it, again, it's based on finances and resources and or whether you have health insurance and it might cover some of it. So mm-hmm. maybe you're going to your general practitioner. I mean, so there's a lot of factors that are involved in making a decision that way. Um, we talk about, too, on the STD project, testing windows, which is important to know oh, because yeah. like a lot of folks will like hook up with someone and then that next day, they're like, oh, man, you know, hook up with somebody over the weekend. And then on Monday morning, they're like, I need to go in and get a test because mm-hmm. I, maybe I didn't use barriers or I didn't have a conversation with them about safer sex. And I don't know if they have multiple partners or maybe a condom broke. You know, maybe I was using barriers or but even even if you were using barriers and had a conversation, there's still you can still get um, contract or you can still contract infections via skin to skin transmission. So there's still risk. So maybe you're just like, uh oh, like, OK, now I need to go in Monday morning. First thing, make sure I'm good to go. Unfortunately, you're going to have to wait for at least three weeks for some of the first or at least two, I should oh, say, wow. um, for some of for some of the infections to even be detectable on a test. And that's called the window period. Mm-hmm. There are two different things that get confused easily. There's an incubation period and a window period. And the window period just means will it show up on a test? It takes a little bit. Even if you even if you have the infection, it doesn't immediately show up on a test. It either has to, if they're testing for like the infection itself or they're, they're testing for the reaction that your body has to the infection. It just depends. And that takes a little while for both of those things to populate and have enough of it to show up on any of those tests. So, gotcha. yeah, so there's a little bit of thought that has to go involved in like, you know, there's nothing wrong with going and getting tested pretty soon after a recent sexual activity and after a hookup, after mm-hmm. sex with any partner or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but just know that even a negative test, you may want to circle back and then do it again in about three months time to make sure that those negatives weren't false negatives. What I, I really like that you were able to, at least in those blog posts, if anyone's curious about it, she walks you right through the entire process of showing up, what questions, what things that were brought up, free condoms. I mean, <laughs> there's some pretty cool things that, uh, that each um, from the UK to the United States, as well as the online one. So if you're curious about any and all of those, go to uh, the uh, ST, the stdproject.com and you can read on those and really get all this great information. One of the things that I was curious about when it comes to reading that, um, or when I was reading it, is it sounded as though some of these STIs or these STDs um, can can really affect long term sexually. Maybe some people are thinking, ah, what's the point in even getting you know, okay, so so many people have STIs or so many people have STDs. What's the point as long as you're not, you know, getting a certain type? But it sounds as though some can affect inf- or can affect fertility and other things. What are what are some of the common ones that uh, that can affect us, even though we don't even know we have it? I love that you did your research. So, yes, like a lot of folks will if you if you know how likely it is to contract an infection which the majority of people who are sexually active end up contracting an STI in some at some point in their lives and most don't know it and so a lot of them clear on their own or they just aren't getting tested and they don't know and so so the answer then or the response might be like well what i don't know won't hurt me why why would i need to know if i don't have any signs or symptoms nothing's out of the ordinary for me i don't have anything that's uncomfortable whatever, nothing, nothing seems out of, out of place. And so what's, what's the real purpose? And unfortunately, some of, especially even some of the curable infections, if you don't get them tested and diagnosed and then treated and cured, they can actually cause irreparable long-term damage. So you mentioned infertility. 
15% of all infertility cases. So like most people, I'm 36. So at my age, I know a few folks who struggled with infertility who wanted to have children and weren't able to. And I are either doing um, IVF or are adopting or not or choosing not to have children at all. And 15% of all those people, it's a result of an untreated STI, an mm-hmm. untreated curable STI. Oh. And so that's, that's like, it's just disheartening because it's, because you don't know, you can't tell, you can't feel it. There are no nerve endings saying, Oh, there's a problem happening. Just like liver damage. There's no nerve endings in your liver. And so mm-hmm. you could drink and drink and drink and your poor liver might be like really struggling uh-huh. and you don't even ever know because there are no nerve endings. You're not feeling that you don't feel the, the, the concern, the issue, whatever that's going on. So same is true. There can be, um, not only that too, cancers, there, there are definitely some risks involved with not being as proactive as possible. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would, I would advise like if you are sexually active and you want to reduce your risk and you are a childbearing person and in wanting to have that option at some point in time, like absolutely still enjoy a sex life and go for it, like high five all day long. <laughs> but, um, but make sure too to be doing as much as you possibly can to reduce your risk. And that's just getting tested. And if you get tested and you're diagnosed, then you take a pill or a couple of pills or get a shot. It just depends on which infection you're diagnosed with. And then it's gone. And mm-hmm. it's like presto, no problem, no issue you know, whatever. So, and you don't even necessarily have to disclose that if it's a curable infection, folks are like really worried. Like, well, do I have to tell people that I had these? And like, do I have to say, and what, what is, how is that going to be viewed? You know, because there's so much stigma with STIs and things. It's like, no, that's, it's really up to you to decide whether you'd like to share that information or not. And it's really nobody's business, but your own. And you are not obligated unless you have a long-term infection. Uh huh. Which might be like HIV or, uh, I think one of those is there, is it legally required? I, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Yeah. So some states, um, most of, most of the states in the U S and I'm actually, I would have to, I would have to look this up. It's been a little while since I looked into this and some countries are like this as well, mm-hmm. require you to disclose HIV to where it actually is a criminal offense. If you don't before engaging in activities with someone. So before putting them at risk, HIV is kind of a subset that's like pulled out and has been has been honed in in that kind of way basically oh. has been pulled out now there are some states though in the US that include other STIs so if you if it's turned if it's if it's if someone finds out that you exposed them to an infection and they contracted it and then you didn't disclose to them in advance they can actually sue and this has happened a fair amount of times in herpes in the case of herpes, because herpes is a forever infection. Mm -hmm. And so folks have contracted herpes from a partner and then later gone on to sue that partner and stated that they didn't tell them in advance before that person decided to have sex with them before they were engaging in activities. And so they put them at risk without giving them an option to consent to that risk. And so um, and this happens a lot of times with really high profile people with a lot of money, essentially, like when oh. there's something to be gotten from it, doing just the regular everyday person doesn't usually amount to much. And there's really not much to be had. Mm-hmm. And um, but anyways, I digress. The point is, is that you can actually do that. And that has been done. And, and those cases have gone through and been successful. And um so, yeah, so it's it's not necessarily criminal for other STIs, but it depends on each specific state. Mm-hmm. And one of your mantras, well, I'm going to use the word mantra, but one of the things that you live by is de, we've got the destigmatizing, but also that you don't lose your life after being, after having a diagnosis of um, an STI or an STD, even if something as long term as herpes. What What are some ways that people can can start to change the mindset because it has been so much of a, or what I've noticed is that STDs have been such a put down thing that if you have it or if you've been diagnosed with it, you can really feel that your entire life is, is nothing but what the diagnosis is. What have been some ways or what are things that you start t- telling other people like, Hey, this does not define who you are. It doesn't define activities you can go through. How do you help people start to make that mind shift to go, you're still a person and you still love a lot of things and you're a person that may be diagnosed with herpes? What? How do you do this? So true. And this is any STI. This is 
Sometimes we separate and pull out HIV, but this is HIV, all viral infections, mm-hmm. all bacterial infections, all long term, short term. It doesn't matter. Is, I mean, this is such a big thing because it is a very, it can actually be a very traumatic experience to get diagnosed with an STI and people do suffer trauma and long term trauma as a result of this diagnosis. And it's unfortunate because it really isn't very representative of most folks' experience. Like some people do experience rejection or have some bad circumstances, bad interactions, and just um, they struggle for a while. I struggled for a while with it and with my diagnosis. However, like I have never had a single partner of mine not want to engage in sexual activities with me because I had herpes. I've never had a single anyone, somebody who was interested in me. And then I disclosed to them and they were like, yeah, no, I guess that's not going to work for me. And the thing is, is that's everyone's prerogative. It's Mm -hmm. their right to say like, I, I'm not willing to accept that risk at this time. And that's totally cool. But I've actually never had that experience. And again, some people do experience rejection when they disclose, but the vast majority of folks, we do interviews on the STD project and um, we've got hundreds and hundreds of anonymous interviews. And the vast majority of folks have like, yep, I have had tons of people and tons of partners not care at all. And that's, and it's not only been like that they didn't want to not engage in activities with me, they plain and simple just not cared. Mm. And I've actually had the response, I think in the last podcast we were talking about, everybody always is worried, like if you have sex, yeah, this we were talking about this in the last one, like if you have sex, you're going to have an unplanned pregnancy or you're going to die because you're going to contract contract an infection you're going to die so don't do it you know it's very bad 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 this fear mongering and whatever that shames people and really does not equip people to make good decisions and the same holds true with like my it was funny because my partners i've had two partners say to me oh when when you told me you wanted to talk to me about something i thought you were going to tell me you were already pregnant with somebody else's kid or in in one instance, I hadn't disclosed to them in advance and engaging with activities, which was not, which was not ethical of me. And I also talk about that a lot on the STD project of like why that happens, how often it happens that people don't disclose and why they don't disclose. And some of it is because of this criminality component, quite honestly, it's Mm. interesting that you asked about that because from my humble experience and my perspective, I believe that criminalizing the transmission of infections actually does a disservice and hinders folks from getting tested. Then they take the, then they take the mindset, well, what I don't know won't hurt me because I don't want to have to worry about having this crazy, scary conversation with partners Mm -hmm. and nothing seems to be bothering me. So I would just like to go on ignorant and totally without, without knowledge of this. And so I don't have to worry about talking about it. But Mm -hmm. anyways, even when you do talk about it, I've had zero rejection and I've had partners be like, Oh, I thought you were pregnant. Like that would have been somehow worse (laughs) than an STI. And in my head, in my mindset with the stigma and how you end up digesting this trauma, how you end up viewing yourself, I really was like, there is nothing worse than now my status. There's Mm -hmm. nothing worse than living with herpes. There's, I, you know, I'm literally, I would rather, I don't even know, rather lose a limb or something or have, or have some wow. other sort of cognitive or physical disability than having herpes. And mm-hmm. it's so crazy because it's, it doesn't even make any sense because <laughs> it's not at all how I define myself. And it, and it doesn't even, and that's what I like to say now. Like I'm, and get, granted, I've come full circle and I'm still, it's, it's an ongoing process. I mean, there are still days where I don't always wake up like super amazingly confident or anything, but for the most part, I realize like, I don't really care what people say because I've heard it all. I mean, there's nothing very original that I get heard or that I get told about me or slurs or anything like that. And I'm like, well, you know, that's somebody else's decision. It's not me. It's not a reflection of who I am and Mm -hmm. what I'm doing. And I get to define myself. Nobody else has that power and that right. You know, we, I can give it away to them and allow them to define me, which I did for years. I really did. And, Mm -hmm. um, but now I'm like, I'm taking that back. I'm over it. I'm over it. And it just doesn't seem like it's going to fit and it's not serving me whatsoever. So that's kind of my, that's, yeah, that is my mantra. You're right about that mantra. Perfect. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) When it, uh, when it comes to being, well, whether we're diagnosed with it and you've, you're talking wonderfully about moving forward into still understanding you still have a life and it's not everything that is for you or that it's not defining you and that partners, it's not going to pull anything necessarily back, but it's just great to be open, honest and knowing who you are and what, what are a part of you just as much as someone may have an injury or anything else. It's like we all experience stuff so we can share that with others. 
I'm curious about. That's, I think, what we forget. Like, there's so much about us. You know, like, nobody puts all of their all of their cards on the table right away. Yeah. Nobody says like, here are all the negative things about me. Now make a judgment when you're first starting to date someone like, and, and we all have things that we hold shame around that we aren't sure is really the best version of ourselves. We have days when we're not the best version of oh, ourselves. Yeah. We have things that we do, but even, even if there's something that we feel is bad or that we do, that's bad. It doesn't make us bad as a whole. Like there's, even some of the most heinous, worst people in history weren't 100% completely bad as a whole. I mean, they were even, they even did some good things. Like Hitler even had a good relationship when you talk to like, can't remember what her, what, what her name was, but when you talk to her, she loved him and thought he was amazing. And they had like this intimate connection. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's not the best example because people <laughs> with STRs aren't Hitler, but we have a tendency to think that about ourselves. Like now we're horrible. We're really the monsters of society mm. that everyone's trying to avoid. And it's like, wait a minute. No, that's one small thing that has nothing to do. You said it, Braxton, you said it has nothing to do with who we are. Like it doesn't mean we're less desirable. It doesn't mean we're less desirable from a physical standpoint, but it also doesn't take away all the cool things that we enjoy that we can add and what, how we add value to relationship and in our own lives and like what our interests are and what what makes us cool and amazing individuals like none of that it's an infection we, it's something we have it's not who we are you oh. know like that Ugh. anyways yes <laughs> definitely so, so what i'm getting from all this is that we have um if if you're curious about it it is wonderful to go get educated it is important to get educated about it if you are wondering if you've got an sti or you're not quite sure or you've been sexually active with someone, it's great to go get tested just to make sure on a lot of different levels because there's some irreparable damage that can be done as well as it's great to know. And it doesn't mean that you're going to all of a sudden become this, uh, this cipher that, uh, that you're going to be cast out from society and that it's important to continue to let others or let yourself know that you can be who you want to be, even if there is an STI or an STD that has been, um, been involved in your life and a lot of them you can take a pill get a shot do something and overcome or get through it so knowing that we've we've covered a lot of these there may be other questions i mean this is such a big topic and we're trying to cover so shortly but i'm wondering is there a takeaway a specific takeaway or are there other things that you wanted to cover and you want the hive mates the people listening to this podcast to be aware of or to know, or that you just really want to drill into, um, society. Hmm. I mean, the, the, the best thing that I can say, or the most powerful thing I can say is that you're your own best advocate. I mean, there are people like myself and there's quite a few of us now. I'm the founder of the, um, herpes activist network hands, which stands for herpes activist networking to dismantle stigma. And there are other people talking about other STIs and living with other STIs, long-term infections and such. And, there's like the dating site, Positive Singles, which I'm, I'm the spokesperson for, right? So there's my little pitch of like, there's a bunch of resources out there. But where I'm going with this is like, and those are great. All of these resources are wonderful. They're helpful. And they help to kind of like provide a perspective of you're definitely not alone. But it's it's all about you. Like you have to decide and choose where you want to head. And like finding as much information and education as possible about STIs, risk, how to reduce risk. And, and then if you contract an STI, like how to view yourself going forward, why stigma originates and persists the way it does, and then what your options are and what kind of things and who to follow and such. Like all of that is totally on you. Like there are advocates like myself, but you are going to be like, you're the maker of your destiny, destiny in that situation. Um, for the most part, which sounds really like hokey, but ultimately every, you can, you can advocate for you better than anybody else can. So I just want to empower people to do that and to seek the resources that in the tone and the people who are uplifting to them and filter out all the rest and all the negative that makes you feel otherwise. And then two, I was going to say Braxton, like we could always do an AMA um, and ask me anything, or if any of your listeners have some follow-up questions and then you want to send them my way, I'm happy to either answer them via a video um, or like we could do like an Instagram, like a social media or something option that way and or just via written. I'm happy to kind of follow up and do some clarification. So if you'd like 
I guess you tell me and you let your listeners know what you think would be best that way. I love that idea. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for offering that to the listeners. This is really a cool opportunity. So anybody that has any questions about STIs, STDs that would like to ask Janelle personally, like in a way, maybe anonymously or however you'd like to, you can email me at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com. You can also send me a text, give a voicemail at 385-449-1818. Again, I don't, I'm not going to answer it. It goes straight to a voicemail or it sends me a text and I can compile all, the, all these. You can also send a Facebook message or an Instagram message, anything that you want. They can remain anonymous. You can put your name on it, whatever you would like. We will honor and respect that. And as I get questions, I'll continue to contact Janelle and uh, we'll either do another episode um, we'll put something up on, on Instagram, but I, I love doing any of that. So if you have any of these questions or anything that we didn't answer in this episode or the last episode, um, we'd love to be here to support you. So thank you for offering that, Janelle. For sure. Happy, happy to, happy to be a part of it. Thanks so much for having the conversation and uplifting it. I appreciate it. No problem at all. I really appreciate you being on the show. Everybody, if there is, if you're curious about all these references, I'm going to put these references on the birdsandbeastpodcast.com blog page as well as into the show notes so you can check those out. But again, thank you so much, Janelle, for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Likewise. Okay, we'll catch everyone in the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to Birds of Beast Podcast. We'll see you then. Wasn't that a great interview? Man, I love interviews like this. Remember, we love when you send these episodes to your friends and family. There's a good chance you know someone who could use some extra support or the information that was just discussed in this last episode. Send them a link. Tell them about it. You can send it through iTunes. Send them the birdsandbeastpodcast.com link. Any way that, that best will get them the information, and it can help a lot to those that you love. We really appreciate you sharing this. Please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. That helps us immensely with getting this content out. And know that that I love you. Love the fact that you guys are helping me out with my goal and sharing this information with the entire world and changing the way that we talk about sexual health and changing the interactions we have with our kids as well as our partners. If you have any questions or you want to join the conversation, send me a call or give me a text at 385-449-1818. Send me an email, birdsandbeastpodcast at gmail.com. All this is going to be great. Love to hear from you hive mates. And I look forward to, uh, to talking with you guys in the next episode. So until then, keep the uh, sexual health buzz alive, and I'll see you in the next episode.